Hello, everyone. I will ask you to hold the rest of that conversation for after our talk today. We have been joined by our friends on Zoom. Welcome, uh, those of you who are joining us virtually today. Um, my name is Emma Dawson, I'm Executive Director at Per Capita, and I'd like to start by paying my respects to the people of the uh, Kulin Nation, the Wurundjeri people, on whose lands we meet today, recognising their uh, generations-long custodianship of the lands and waters on which we meet, lands which were never ceded. Um, it's lovely to be back with you all in 2023. Uh, as I flagged up front, um, this is a little bit of an in-house and a very, very special sneak peek for all of you uh, on Per Capita's new Centre for Equitable Housing. We haven't even launched the centre yet, um, but you are a family, so we wanted to give you the inside running and hope that you will uh, kind of support us in the work that we do. I'm going to hand over to Matt Lloyd Cape um, from our team, who is now the director of the Centre for Equitable Housing, which is funded very generously by you and I'm Dean, uh, who's here today uh, from the VNF Housing Enterprise Foundation. And let Matt tell you a little bit about what we'll be up to. Thanks, Emma. Um, so thanks for coming today to hear about the launch of our new centre. Uh, it's the Centre for Equitable Housing. I'm Matthew Lloyd Cape, or Matt Lloyd Cape. I'll be the director, and I'm delighted to have here Hugh Belfrich, who is uh, representing our founder donor, BNF uh, Housing Enterprise Foundation, a philanthropic trust established to tackle housing affordability in Australia. I'd also like to acknowledge that we meet on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. When we talk about housing and land, it's really important that we remember the deep and long-lasting effects of colonialism on um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, their access to home, country, and land. Indigenous Australians are far less likely to own their own home than other Australians, and the majority are renters in the land where their ancestors have lived for 60,000 years. Um, so, housing can be a tricky topic to talk about. It's our most intimate and personal space, for some people, it represents family, security, self-expression. For the wealthiest, it represents status, privilege, and even dominion. The most expensive home in the world is said to be Buckingham Palace, uh, valued at 4.5 billion US dollars. Although the way the British economy is going, it might come up for a lot cheaper than that. <laughs> <laughs> for other people, housing can represent something quite different. Undersized, overcrowded, insecure, and far from friends, family, and work. For homeowners, um, rap rapidly rising house prices can give a secret thrill. The way some homeowners talk about prices is almost like a secret kink, something thrilling and slightly shameful. There is also a bit of a smugness and condescension in some of the debate about uh, why people can't afford a home. For renters, the house price debate often leads to feelings of resentment, disdain and anger. Technical problems. <laughs> um, these things and emotions are sometimes hard to reconcile and aren't always very useful for understanding how we've come to this position and what the solutions might be for achieving more affordable housing. In this speech, I want to talk a little about um, the kind of housing market that we have, some of the strange quirks and problems that it has, um, and I'll discuss some of the major trends and themes in policy making and political issues that have led the CAPTA and BNF Foundation to establish the Centre for Equitable Housing. We're then really delighted to share with you some of the highlights from our recent survey, one of the largest ever housing surveys in which we've tested the attitudes and experiences of 4,733 Australians regarding housing affordability and policy. This survey gives us a key starting point for unpacking contemporary housing affordability issues and debates. And then we'll talk a little bit about our plans for the centre. But first, let's talk about Harry Trigoboff's birthday. <laughs> Harry Trigoboff is a billionaire, and he turned 90 last week. Guests at his party included two former prime ministers and the great and the good of high society, and Peter Dutton. He is the CEO of the construction company Meriton, through which he's built around 76,000 apartments all up and down the East Coast and all the way through to Melbourne. To give you a sense of the scale at which the company works, something like 10% of all apartments built in Sydney are built by Meriton. And in an interview with the AFR to recognise his birthday, uh, Mr Trigoboff made the following statement about building apartments in a falling market. He said, the government cannot allow prices to go down a lot, 
and the banks cannot allow prices to go down a lot. They were always my two partners. Now, that might seem like a fairly innocuous statement, but I think it reveals something about how the housing market operates, which is that it doesn't really operate like a free market at all. Similarly, comments from APRA um, reinforce this view, APRA's financial regulator. Uh, in 2021, APRA's chairman said, it's not our job to solve housing prices, and it's not our job to solve house pricing affordability. However, in January this year, the new chair stated that APRA was ready to ease lending re regulations on mortgages to ensure that banks do not choke off uh, mortgage credits. What this tells us is that we've built in ratchets, ratchets into house pricing. Prices can go up a lot, and then they come down a little, and then they can go up a lot again. Our comrades at the Henry George Foundation and Prosper would uh, also point out that the housing market isn't like most markets because essentially every slice of land is a monopoly. Um, once somebody owns it, nobody else can replicate it, reproduce it, or utilize that land. As Mark Twain has thought of once said, buy land, they're not making it anymore. <laughs> In fact, it's very interesting that most of our early political economists, from Adam Smith to Karl Marx, spent a great deal of their time grappling with the issue of capturing unearned income from, uh, from land and producing a more fair society from that. They identified that land had a special characteristic. It doesn't erode in value over time, it's not reproducible, and it's immobile, which is the exact opposite features of capital. And yet most uh, economists these days always, almost always lump capital and land in together when they're making their financial models which is part of the story of how we've ended up with such a problematic set of policies regarding housing affordability. So let's talk about some of those causes of housing affordability. Um, we detailed a lot of the causes um, in our report last year called Housing Affordability in Australia, Tackling a Wicked Problem. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail, um, but some of the factors are quite interesting to discuss. Um, some factors of why house prices are so unaffordable are very specific to Australia. Our geography and urban settlement is highly conducive to hot local markets. Australia is quite unique in having half of its population in just three cities. And our cities are often built around a CBD model, which concentrates demand for housing in a tight circle. Low population density and the tyranny of distance makes urban sprawl more inevitable than regional city development. Other common causes around the world um, are experienced here as well. So many countries have deregulated their mortgage markets over the last 40 years, allowing larger loans um, to, to mortgage borrowers over longer periods of time. Investors are increasingly treated by banks on similar terms to owner occupiers, and banks are testing the limits of these at the moment, with NAB now accept, accepting Airbnb rental forecasts as sufficient for lending to investors. Some of these failures are due to policy drift in which once genuinely serviceable policies have changed so much that they no longer fit the needs of society. For example, the role of public housing was originally intended to provide non-market rental space based upon an implicit responsibility for housing by state and federal governments. However, other than a short burst of construction of public housing during the global financial crisis, public housing has dropped off dramatically and the shortfall is now in the hundreds of thousands. Our level of public housing is lower than many comparable countries, with around 3% of the population being social renters. This compares to about 17% in the UK. Some of the causes of unaffordable housing are due to policy capture. For example, in many local planning processes, uh, incumbents can block medium density, medium density developments in areas where dwellings are most needed, such as the inner rings of Melbourne and Sydney. And some of the blame lies in political policy making motivated by desires to capture the votes or reward voter loyalty for the majority of the population who already own one or more houses. Capital gains tax, exemptions, and negative gearing are the most prominent examples. So these processes have driven up house prices and land values specifically, um, facilitated speculation on housing and encouraged what is known as the financialization of housing. This has led to the subservience of housing shelter as a right, both in policy and in common discourse, to the rights of property investors seeking wealth creation. An example of the extent of financial, financialization in Australia is that 60% of the balance sheets of our big four banks is now made up of residential mortgages. Financialization of housing has led to a meanness in policy and public discourse, partly as people seek to foster an individualized social security through housing wealth, and partly due to the permissiveness of our current policy regime, which rewards housing market behaviors, permissiveness, 
of our current policy regime, which rewards housing market behaviours which is socially aggressive. A feedback loop between incumbent homeowners and politicians has made this an increasingly difficult problem to resolve. The result is that house prices have outstripped wages by quite some margin. So that's enough about my opinions. As part of the establishment of the Centre for Equitable Housing, we commissioned a large nationally representative survey of public attitudes and uh, experiences. We asked Australians to tell us about their experience of housing affordability, what they thought about rising prices, how they viewed current policies, and what they thought about the different solutions for uh, housing affordability. This involved a survey, a survey of 4,733 people in December last year. Each of the respondents um, we gathered 160 data points about, which meant that we have over th uh, th 750,000 data points to, to deal with. So a very rich source of data to play with. Uh, we also included some questions from previous surveys so that we could explore, explore some differences over time in what people think. So what did we find? How visible is this? Um, so what we found in regards to affordability is that there's a decline in, in overall affordability of mortgages and rents. So I say affordability is declining because uh, ANU asked a similar question in 2017. Mm -hmm. And what we found was that while people in 2017 generally were more likely to find that they were keeping up without any difficulty with their rent or mortgage or struggling from time to time, there's a shift of about 5% of the population from these generally keeping up to constantly struggling and falling behind in that payments. So it's around 5.6% of the population is moving from relative uh, affordability to unaffordability, which if you extrapolate out would be about 1.25 million people. Um, we found that the experiences of the housing market were highly gendered. Women experienced significantly worse housing outcomes than men across a range of measures. For example, when it comes to mortgages, 21% of women are constantly struggling to pay their mortgage, whereas it's only 15% of men. When it comes to those behind, it's 5% of women, 3% of men. Um, another example, 32% of men report receiving financial support from their families when buying their first house. So nearly a third uh, compares to a quarter of women. Men were also much more likely to gain um, from our generous investor arrangements, such as negative gearing and capital gains tax, with 18% of male respondents reporting owning an investment property compared to 11% of women. Clearly, this is unacceptable, and we aim to specifically highlight some of these inequalities in the coming report, which my colleague Michael McKenzie is going to be working on in the next few months. So, what do people think about the general fairness? Most Australians believe that the housing market, as it stands, is causing economic and social problems. We asked people uh, whether they thought rising house prices were bad for the economy, and around two-thirds say that it is. It changes for generations. So here we have the older generation, around 50% of uh, the older generation, people are 77 and above, think that house prices are causing uh, problems for the economy and that rises all the way up to 70% of millennials. Around two thirds of people think that uh, rising property values are also benefiting those that are already well off, widening the gap between the rich and the poor in society. For people trying to buy their first home, prices and deposit rates are a major concern. 86% of renters who want to own a home are concerned about their ability to buy a house in their lifetime. This compares to about 68% of people answering a similar question in 2017. So 20%, 25% increase. 70% of respondents from households earning under 104,000 a year um, say that the only way they'll be able to buy a house is if they receive a large inheritance. So this indicates that a growing intergenerational challenge of home ownership is really coming through. Mm -hmm. And for low income, people for, uh, for whom pay. So we in this room will think that housing is very important, but how important is housing in determining how people vote? Um, we ask people to score different policy issues on a scale of one to 10 in terms of how likely it was to impact their vote in the next federal election. 
This graph shows the proportion of people who must an issue seven or more out of ten. What we have is the youngest generations on the left and the oldest to the right. So as you can see, <coughs> reducing the cost of living, that bar under the set of bars on the left, is the most important issue for people at the next federal election, followed by improving the health system. And housing affordability is number three there. But as you can see, it's very stratified across the different generations. So for, for people aged 57 and above, it's, uh, it's moderately important, whereas for the Gen X, uh, sorry, Gen Y and Gen Z, it's the second most important issue um, on offer. And I think there's a chance that that level of stratification, it's the most stratified answer that we had in this group, um, explains partly why uh, there's such a mismatch between the debates between um, gen between the generations with that boomer millennial conflict that we've seen. When it comes to political party preferences, Green voters are the most likely to regard housing affordability as of high importance. So you can see that blue bar along the top, it's the Greens, um, with more than 80% uh, of them saying that it's, uh, housing is of high importance, um, and Labour is not far behind. And this filters all the way down to the nationals at the bottom, for whom <coughs> housing affordability is least important. And one of the interesting things we did in the survey was ask people who were likely to change their vote um, what uh, how they ranked housing as well. So for the average Labour voter, 65% of um, average Labour voters placed housing as highly important. But for people that are likely to change their vote from Labour, that rises to 77.8%. And for the Liberals, it's even worse. Um, so for Liberals as a whole, only 55.7% see housing affordability as a major issue. But for people that are likely to shift their vote from the Liberals, that rises to 80.5%. And I think that's really important when we're thinking about how we're going to affect change for housing affordability. If we want to see policy changes, then it's going to be those voters that are likely to push for significant change in the major parties. Um, so, oh, and policy solutions. Um, I'm not sure how visible this all is, but we have asked people a range of policy options for what they think would improve housing affordability as it stands. But the most popular um, policy option was to increase the supply of public housing. 70% of people we asked said that increasing the supply of public housing was the best solution to housing affordability. And it was quite an interesting one because um, that carried across all the generations with older people being more likely to support that than any other policy solution. Whereas many other policy, policy solutions were preferable for young people. Um, rent caps were surprisingly popular so rent caps, which limit um, rental increases, um, that reached something like 68% of the population improving. And surprisingly, even um, people that own one investment property, more than half of them support the rent caps as well. Um, the idea that the government could step in to limit the amount of profit that banks make, obviously a high scorer. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, we'll, we'll send it on the slides if you're interested. So there's some of the highlights from the survey. Clearly, there's a lot of distress and discontent in the community about housing. Um, and what's the centre going to do about that? Well, as you can imagine, we'll be spending a lot of our time uh, exploring the causes and the consequences of a poor housing system. Um, we'll be looking at best practice, practice examples from around the world and in Australia and developing ambitious and novel policy solutions. But we also want to get under the hood a bit more regarding what people think and where public appetite for reforms may lead us. We think that housing affordability attitudes, sorry, we think that the housing affordability, affordability attitudes survey is a foundation for supporting more productive and informed public debate about housing experiences and opinions. And we intend to repeat the survey on an annual basis to provide us with a live understanding of attitudes. A big part of our work will be in challenging public perceptions that the housing system is some sort of independent and untamable beast. The high level of pessimism that we've seen in our survey suggests that this is what the public thinks. And so we want to use our resources to engage with the public debate and present an alternative vision from which real change can come. We think that ambitious policy making in government will only follow a shift in public sentiment. So we want to develop 
the public's understanding that we as a society have the capacity to reimagine a more equitable housing system. Thanks for listening. <laughs>
So our view um, in the foundation is that. Um, Okay. <laughs> Our view broadly is that um, this is not a, so much a problem of government expenditure, although that is part of it because there's, the governments have been backing away from spending on public housing for over a number of decades. We're focused on the way the market, on, on the financialisation of housing and seeking a a definancialization essentially, which is a tremendously delicate process. Um, politically, it's tremendously delicate because of the national conflict of interest we have in, in, in downward movement in property values. And also economically, it's tremendously delicate because it's, um, it's so woven into our economy. However, um, it's not to say there are, there are a lot of smart people around who can nut out these problems at a policy level. And where we are actually focused in, the, in our foundation is trying to shift the way people think and feel about housing in the community, because that is what will allow political change to happen, policy change. Yeah. Can I have uh, that's a terrific point here and this picks up because I look at the figures and how much people are paying in rent and mortgages of their proportion of their income and that means all of that money is not going into the rest of the economy. So it's not that the government has to spend the money, it's the fact that the whole economy is consumed by property and high property prices and rents affect not just housing but business. So they have to cut their costs by cutting their wage costs while their rents go up and up and up. And often their rents are to people who have not got highly leveraged across many different properties. So we go back to, this is where Jesse comes in from the, the George's point of view, but the whole idea about land and the rights we have to land uh, and because it's actually eating the economy. Yes, the, the the orcas thing sound awful, it's going to cost a lot. But frankly, they'll just print the money. Yeah. It's not going to come out of revenue. So it's not an issue that we have that or that at all. The issue is that how this is actually destroying our whole economy. And, and all <coughs> this money is wasted money going into the pockets of the financiers, to the banks. The Take way. that as a comment, Jennifer. It's a really good one. <laughs> yeah. So there's no extra... Uh, benefit for that extra capital, so no, increasing no, productivity. It's not doing anything productive. And, and, no, the minute, right. and the minute you buy, you know, when, once you buy a property, you need prices to go up. Yes. And when you're wanting to buy a property, you want it to go down. So you've got a powerful class conflict mm -hmm. at the core of your society. Yeah. And we do need to remember that this whole landmass was colonised mm -hmm. by people for land. It's part of the great. European and particularly Anglo land grant of taking land from indigenous people in North America and here um, in South Africa and it's to get land and it's the problem is the land and how we value that. If I had a magic wand, the moment of becoming a republic, which we could do on the 26th of January, <laughs> would be the moment in which we relinquish the Crown's ownership of the land and replace it with not just First Nations, but the peoples. <coughs> uh, and therefore, what we pay to go pay for land. So the sort of thing that the Victorian government is doing with the housing, that new housing thing of having these short-term uh, rent of land to developers and it goes back to the government. That's something to think about. Yeah, and land, rate, land rent schemes. Yes, uh, right, yes. They're into, they're, they're, they've been working in um, ACT sometime as well. Um, but it's worth remembering with the banks that 60% of their asset base is residential mortgages. You know, that's when we, when we talk about financialization, that. Well, that's the, brilliant for the economy. It's actually yeah. really bad for the economy. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> it's not you. No. Yeah. I just want to jump in and say this about this, this office thing. Let's not get distracted down this path. Like Janet said, they'll print the money for defense. They always do. They're talking about taking it from the defense. 
this project. If we get distracted into an argument of we can either have that or we can have this, we're not going to get anywhere. You know, they're going to, they're going to spend money on defence. Every government ever always has. But the key thing for us is to say these are the pressing social issues that we need to invest in. So after the Second World War, the um, federal government offered 53-year loans to the states to build public and affordable housing. You know, printing money that's written off over 50 years, essentially. That's one of the ways we can resolve this. So there's a question here. Yeah. Um, economists used to talk about first best, second best, third best solutions to all sorts of things. <clears throat> and it seems to me we, this is a language we may want to reappropriate. I mean, I lament you know, Bill Shorten's policies which were in the category of first best to try and deaden demand, you know, got defeated in 2019 and somehow that debate's got to be re-engineered mm. and not see this, you know, ripping people off but actually trying to bring the thing down steadily yeah. and, and get, get the demand side down. But the second thing I'd like to say is pick up on that first point up there, increase the supply of public housing, what you just said. I mean, I'm really pleased the SEC leads back. I'd like to see the Housing Commission come back. Yeah, I'd like to see a CSHA come back along the line you just talked about. I mean, it used to be two for one, Common put in two dollars, states put in one. Yeah. You know, states lost money every time they build houses because the rents are so low, so it's it's economically madness to do it, but socially it's got benefits. Mm. So I would like to encourage you to think about trying to reinvent that first, second, third order stuff and try and get the debate structured and a little more sensible than the yeah. kind of nonsense, which is just lamentable. Well, without having the um, <coughs> CSHA, the Commonwealth State Housing Agreements, we don't have that overarching ambitious planning. And that's something that we've, we've heard that there's maybe some appetite for in the government mm -hmm. and having some, some sort of co-ag agreement developed towards the middle of this year, having um, consultations towards the middle of this year. Mm -hmm. But yeah, without that national coordination, if we're always on the back foot and reactive, we're never going to solve this particular problem. Because so I've been involved in community house for years. It's a dumb way to do this lot of stuff. It's just expensive, it's slow, it's just minuscule. Community housing. Absolutely. But it's a good idea. I'm not proposing it. It's good for particular needs. But as a large scale response, mm. it's ineffective and never will be effective. It's too slow. And the way we do things with massive tenders, housing associates put up $50,000 bids with no guarantee of getting supplied and only 10 can bid anyway. Yeah. It's a really inefficient way to do a large scale response. Yeah. I mean, right. the days when you build three or 4,000 units a year in housing conditions is the only way you can do it. And you just, you just create a pipeline. That's it. May we've talked about that sometime. Um, question there, sorry. Uh, question from a viewer and her, <coughs> Shane Arthurson. What about the facilitation of turning renters into homeowners for those who want to? Would this require shared equity for homeowners and a policy shift to remove such high levels of investment? To, to turn renters into homeowners? Yeah. For a shared equity. Yeah, I mean, the government's obviously has some ambitions in, in that area. Um, it's uh, deeply unpopular with some people. I'm not too sure if it's the solution we need. We're still adding more fuel to the fire, adding more investment capacity into house price markets. So um, I think reducing the prices of houses is more important. And and one way of doing that is, you know, if we were to invest in public housing sufficiently, that would drag down the lower end of the um, housing market so that first time buyers would be, wouldn't be competing with people that should be housed in public housing in the first place. Could I just add to, to Matt's answer there? Um, any government money that's going into uh, to subsidise housing is. Sorry, government money which is going into to subsidise housing is subsidising the ultimate owners of, of, of properties and so Commonwealth rent assistance. Uh, and, and the current government's scheme, which is not to say they're not necessary, but they're part of a system which is not uh, functioning efficiently economically. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks for saying what I was trying to say much more articulately. <laughs> Jesse. Uh, hi, Matt. Um, thanks for presenting. I had this uh, interest in your finding around rent controls. <laughs> it does seem a bit odd that property owners are willing to trade off future income in terms of what they could get from rent rises, but they're not willing to accept changes to taxes that might do the same thing. So do you think there's some sort of maybe insight there that uh, in the financialization of housing, depending on how it's framed or constructed, there are ways to convince property owners to trade off 
future returns to their housing assets in order to benefit renters and <coughs> social housing? I think in Australia, many investors invest for the capital gains over the long term. They're less worried about the rental yields. You know, here in Australia, we have famously low rental yields compared to the US or other countries um, because people are looking towards that sale in five years or 10 years or 20 years. Um, so if you maintain the negative, like it makes sense if you think about it in those terms, maintaining the negative gearing and capital gains tax is something they definitely want to do, you know, gains tax discount, because that is where they see the benefit of owning it. <laughs> I also think there's a whole bunch of shy investors out there who own a holiday home, or maybe they've helped their kids buy a home by laying down the deposit, they might own it on paper. I think there's a big cohort of investors that are willing to see change. We asked people if they were willing to see their houses drop in value to help housing affordability, and we got something like 40% saying yes to that, and something like 35% of investors in a single property. And as soon as you ask people that own two or more investment properties, that changes very quickly. But for the single <laughs> investment property owners, there is a big cohort, I think, of people that are willing to um, see some sacrifices somewhere along the line. But yeah, rental yields, if you connect to the gear anyway, it doesn't really matter. You, know, you just write your losses off anyway, right? So, right. Yeah. it's interesting that it doesn't come up in the political discourse at the moment, even though it appears that it's actually really popular. Yeah, yeah, surprisingly popular. I mean, the second most popular thing. So, yeah, worth exploring more. And I think just the volatility. People have seen the eighty percent rises, the you know these these incredible increases, and they know that that is morally indefensible. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Incredible increases, and they know that that. Is morally uh, indefensible. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I'm really quite interested in the policy solutions because the vast majority of them require government funding in order to actually uh, be realised. Uh, and there's a couple that don't, which is the point you've been making about negative hearing and capital gains tax, actually score quite low. Yeah. I, I just wonder what the dimension of this issue is and uh, <coughs> whether there's any sensitivity to the head. Um, uh, sunset clauses on existing properties and so on, whether there's a, a sensitivity that we can actually determine what that reduces in mm. real terms, in money terms, um, because I, I, I don't know quite what the dimension is that we're, we're looking at here, because it's so emotive for those that are affected, but in fact, the percentage of people affected is, is, is moderately low uh, yeah. compared to the rest of the community. So, I, I just think that these are disappointing that we didn't get it in 2019, but I don't think we should give up. Yeah. Uh, and understanding the dimension and the metrics involved. Yeah, I think a couple of really interesting points on this. And one is obviously the hit job that was done on negative gear by the right wing press during the last election campaign definitely has bruised the potential for this policy. But it's also partly about how you ask the question. So um, negative gearing. Um, if you just ask the question in isolation, remove tax incentives like negative gearing, the score is second to the bottom. If you ask, should the government remove tax deductions for housing investors and use the money to build more public and community housing, much higher score. So it's partly about the framing of the question and um, how we sell it. You know, obviously, as we're saying, these, are, these things aren't trade-offs. We don't have to say it's one thing or the other. But if the government was to say, We'll, we'll look at removing negative gearing to increase public housing supply. It appears from this survey that that would be much more popular. And the dimension of the fiscal revenue that I might get from that, how material is that? Uh, so it's projected to be for capital gains tax discounting and negative gearing on investment properties, 20 billion a year in the near future. Yeah. So it's uh, it's pretty it's substantial. So it's a lot of public housing. Yeah, and if you think about the, the housing future fund that they have announced, the revenues from that's around, they reckon, 500 million a year, and we're at the same time giving 20 billion a year to housing investors. This, you could, I think you could do something there. Anyway. And Matt, could I again just add, add a thought? Um, in, in terms, in addition to revenue, and it's not clear what the if the, if, if the change of those policies reduced demand, then re that would bring revenue, revenue gain down. But the objective, again, from our point of view, would be to reduce demand. And to, um, because investor demand is elastic, it, it increases with as capital gain 
um, is we're coming to a, a cycle of capital gain, and it, it falls back um, in a period like we're in at the moment when the capital gain is paused or ceased. So if you took if you reduced demand structurally by by removing de incentivizing property as an investment of choice, um, that could affect the market uh, property values uh, in a more structural way, yeah. much more significantly potentially than the revenue that that might bring. Mm. That's right. So that's a two for one. Yeah. 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 Yes, please. So I was interested in the figure that uh, those in the mortgage distress were one, you know, they extrapolated to 1.25 million. I think that's really important in this housing discussion that we don't lose is that that means that there are a number of large numbers of children and young people living in poverty. So ACOS would put it currently about 1.2 million, which actually sits very well with your um, with your figures. And so I think it's an important intersection um, because I think the most vulnerable, um, the most vulnerable young people are those that are living in poverty. And, you know, in the, the era of law and order, interestingly, the background briefing, background briefing have done a podcast with two fairly senior young men in gang activity in southwest of Sydney, and they named it exactly that. Mm. They said, how do, you, how do you come to this? Um, they said, poverty. I mean, they didn't name, you know, they talked about stealing shoes off yeah. houses, you know, and just, and having to put food on the table. So they actually named it that poverty was the key. And then they said, this is not the one we would have chosen. Mm. So, yeah. you know, that intersection between housing and poverty and, and what that means for broader <clears throat> society impact. And we're seeing this in Melbourne. This is my area of work. We're seeing um, young people that are turning to gang activity, organised crime, um, are using them as foot soldiers because of poverty. Mm. I, I know she's definitely going to want to talk about this, but one thing I wanted to comment on is how in the past we've had, uh, if you measure poverty before housing costs and after housing costs, in the time when we were building sufficient public housing, after housing costs, uh, after housing costs, poverty rates were lower than before housing cost poverty rates. Whereas now, housing costs contribute massively to pushing people into poverty. So before, housing used to pull people out of poverty, and that pushes them into it. Hugh, do you want to talk about childhood? And, yeah. Yes, that's a, an area close to my heart. I, my background is in social work. Um, it's it's something I go to immediately over the whole course of, of a child's development. There's money being taken out of that household that need not happen. We didn't live like this decades ago. We had. And and it's a difference. You know, I believe it affects the life course of, of lots of children and all kinds of, you know, it's a powerful social determinant. It's not the only one, but it's a, it's a critical one. And um, that is affecting the developmental experience. I mean, the way I think about it is the the difference between the, 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 the you know, a richer, an ordinary rich life is the way I think about it. We could have that in Australia. We're a wealthy country and the life that a lot more children are experiencing now where there's money, a lot of money taking out of the, the household. Um, the, the social outcomes, the financial outcomes over a life course are quite profound. And, Um, <clears throat> I'm very interested in the, this financialization of housing, and I think you know, you're spot on in terms of that issue. I do see it, however, as a bit of a trickle-down approach, and I'm not using that in a derogatory sense, it actually might work, as opposed to all the other trickle-downs, but it will, will it not... There's a, there's a group of people where the impact of that trickle down effect, perhaps lower rents, perhaps less, uh, higher affordability, will not make a difference in a material sense. So I'm hoping that the focus of your work will be both on that and the group of people that just are not going to be materially affected by the benefits that I'm sure will flow if some of these policies mm. changes are made. Well, I, th I think, um, you know, public housing is a, is a great example here. You know, if you set rents at 25% of someone's income, then it doesn't matter how poor they get, they will always, you know, in theory, be able to afford their, their rents, right? But at the same time, 
if you're taking all those people out of the private rental market, that you know, putting them into public housing, that should cool off the housing market at that lower end and bring down bring down house prices for for first time buyers and so on. So they're not going to be competing with land, private landlords anymore. So I think that the two things are sort of intimately related. That those people that will never potentially never hope to own a home um, should be the first beneficiaries, but then the flow on effects travel on up as well. And I'm also concerned about you know, affordable housing being a, a very broad term. Mm. Really. Almost useless. Almost you know. useless, yeah, in terms of, well, we'll put it, we'll provide for some sort of work here and we'll throw in a few very expensive apartments there and that'll pay for a bit of it. And what's left mm. is less yeah. than there should be. It's, it's not really, it's not really affordable. Yeah, and you know, we, and we've had policies that properly defined affordability in the past. You know, the Menzies government they changed the housing government, the housing policies from being about public housing provision for social renting towards building low cost housing to sell to to people at a below market rate, and that was their approach to public housing creation. But it was still the government building it and controlling the flow of housing into into the housing system, rather than always relying on the market to. Hopefully, guide us in the right direction, which is kind of where we're at the moment. Yeah. Jesse? Yeah, I was going to raise the recent superannuation changes um, in regards to maybe changes in housing policy. In your survey, you looked at people with like more like than two properties and so on. Do you think there's any evidence maybe in the survey that could indicate that if things like the year were just capped, like the amount of deductions you could claim, or maybe the amount of tax exempt um, capital gains you could claim in, so that it only affected a small proportion of um, total property owners or taxpayers, like with the superannuation changes like the top you know, 1% mm -hmm. of accounts, that you could maybe take out a slice of that um, tax concession revenue of like 20 billion a year, you know, even getting one or two billion would be a significant mm -hmm. improvements over, you know, 500 million, that yeah. there might be some sort of political scope or evidence in the data that suggests that is more feasible than the recent attempts um, in 2019. I don't know if we've got enough granularity to be able to say that particularly, but um, yeah, there's certainly an appetite for, uh, particularly among, you know, rents and for non-investment owners especially, especially I think um, affecting uh, tax concessions for investors is very popular obviously among private renters. Mm. So it's partly who you sell it to and what seats as well, isn't it? But um, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Just looking at where you where you draw the line, where you, where you want to shave off. And there might be ways to then build in bracket creep, like what they've done with mm. those recent changes, so that over time everyone just gets pushed into the bracket without realizing, like we do with income tax. Mm. So you're grandfathering it off, you know, naturally rather than yeah. It's, it's a good idea. Yeah. Great. Yes. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you. I wanted to ask about with public housing, especially specific groups, especially young people, are not able to access public housing at all because of the various barriers around it. Um, so I wonder if that's also something that you've looked into is not only increasing the supply of public housing, but actually looking at how do people access public housing. Mm. So that's a great point. I, I think the original um, 1945 Commonwealth State, State Housing Agreement had no income testing at all on public housing. And it was introduced to later in the 70s and, and then it sort of led to this point where we've residualized public housing for only those families most in intolerable need, you know, essentially. <laughs> so I think um, it would require, require a big increase in stock to be able to then um, allow housing stock to allow people to then say, yeah, to a young person, there you go. But um, obviously, in that, this day, these days, we've got more and more young people living with their parents for longer and longer. And that's one thing we did notice in the survey is the amount of people that have been living with their parents for 10 years, say. So. Um, yeah, I think part of the solution might be improvements in the private rental market as well. Now, we do have some of the worst uh, rental uh, laws in the Western world in terms of tenure length, you know, the, Something like eight percent of our survey respondents who rent were renting on a six-month lease. You know, it's just, how can you plan your life in a six-month lease? So making those changes in the private rental market 
and if the, you know, I don't think rent caps will ever come in, but if there were ways of limiting rental costs and improving tenure quality in the rental market, that might um, negate the need for more young people in public housing, I suppose. Mm. Could I, could I, could I just add a little to that? So um, I'm not sort of as constrained, so I'm not an economist, so I'm here to um, talk more freely about how I, I, I view things. Um, so uh, the big picture we, we see is that because housing is an essential for life, um, that imposes a, a requirement, a responsibility on governments to facilitate access to housing. Now, most of that access has been through the housing market and providing public housing is a supplement to people who don't have the means to access housing via the, the, the market. So what's happened is that, that access to housing via the market has become much, much more difficult. So that's put a more, that's put a great, at the same time, governments have retreated from providing public housing. So when I hear you say, you know, how can young people, uh, talking about young people accessing housing, public housing, it breaks my heart because housing is such a, uh, you know, setting up your own home, it's such a, a rite of passage to step into you as you step into your adult life. There should be a pathway for young people to access housing through the market and the, the regulation of the market then sits with government. And that's where we have landed is that we need to re-regulate the market. We need to look at the way the market's regulated because it's driving this problem. Not There still is a need for more um, social housing and public housing but it's not the solution to the housing affordability um, situation. Can I just add on to it really quickly as well? What we found, so we work to um, be active to represent young people in the youth sector. And what we've found is that while the government's recognised that 16% of young people are homeless, make up the homeless population, um, there's only 1% of the big housing bill in Victoria has been dedicated to young people. And so on top of that, the data that they're using is saying, well, young people aren't in public housing, so there mustn't be a massive need for more public housing for young people. Because they must, they must be fine in the, the private rental system or must be fine living at home with their parents. And so it's kind of driving this further divide. So I, I completely agree that young people should be able to, you know, build their own homes and um, access the private rental market. But for those people who are really struggling, young people who are really struggling, there is no in for them. Mm. And that's that's where I'm coming from, right. is from their perspective. It's very Orwellian, what you say. <laughs> yeah. It's only 1% that can access it, so only 1% need it. I think that's a really good point. And I suppose um, there's a lot of... Maybe I'm just naive about the level of professional um, specific services available to young people. Um, probably it might be naivety about what there is available. So I'd love to hear, hear more about that from you. Yeah. I just wanted to make a comment to back up Lily's point. The transfer of public housing stock to community housing providers, as the government has retreated from owning it, um, has left community housing providers with more discretion about their tenancies, and that works against young people. Because yeah. mm. they're regarded as unreliable or unsurrogate yeah. tenants. Yeah. And so, you know, it is, that hasn't been a good move for young people. Yeah. And again, that's part of the finance, like the marketization of, of public housing into social housing is part of the story. And as we've discussed before, May, you know, the provision of services as though they were a quasi market it just doesn't work. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your informed comments and questions and conversation as always. Um, it has been a really sneak peek because we haven't launched the centre yet. Um, the survey will be out in the next couple of weeks and, uh, and we'll be formally launching the centre, have a few big events. Um, and as you mentioned and I've mentioned, we are looking for partners, anyone who's interested in working with uh, this in this space with us, please uh, do approach us and let us know. We do believe that um, this is a 
probably the biggest economic challenge facing the country and in order to resolve it we're going to need many hands uh, to make what is a really big challenge into preferably something manageable. Um, I won't keep you much longer, we're nearly at two o'clock, it's been lovely to see you all. Next month we will be, this is news to everyone on my team because I'm doing everything at the last minute at the moment, um, uh, next month we'll be joined by Dr Chris Wallace from the Australian National University, uh, economic, uh, political historian and biographer. She is the co-editor with uh, Michelle Grattany and Brenda McAuliffe of the upcoming book the Morrison government governing through crisis, uh, which takes a retrospective <laughs> look at the Morrison government. And I, I wrote the chapter therein on social security and robo debt, uh, which was enraging to write. Um, so Chris will join us next month to talk about that book. We'll have the books available for sale. Um, it should be a very interesting. Uh, plans are slightly delayed for our John Kane oration this year because of my delay in coming back to work this year. And, um, for those of you who don't know, I was delayed coming back to work because I lost my husband last month. Um, so I've been on bereavement leave, but I'm okay. And it's my team has been amazing. I want to thank you all for keeping the ship afloat. Um, and it's really lovely to be back. And I look forward to seeing you all in April. Thank you.